next section is on expected values. Let's start by deciding, defining what an expected value is. The expected value of a discrete random variable, uh, which we are often dealing with e x, is given below. So the expected value of x is equal to the sum of x times the probability mass function of x wherever the probability mass function of x is non-zero. Uh, this is just a more general way to write down what expected values are. Uh, in principle, most of the time, the x over which you're summing are the integers. So if you really wanted to, most of the time you'll be okay thinking of expected values as this, like um, x equals, let's say, 0 to infinity. Or another way we could do it is, this is actually allowed, uh, x equals negative infinity to infinity. Um, or if you know what that um, your little x ranges from a to b, you could say, uh, we could say um, x equals a to b. There's all sorts of ways we could possibly rearrange this. But really what matters is that you're summing up uh, this expression, uh, x times the probability mass function of x, wherever that probability mass function is non-zero. So I'm just going to leave this as x such that probability mass function of x is greater than zero. Actually, I'm just going to not even really say all that much over what x we're summing over. I'm just going to say that you sum over x. Okay. Next, uh, expected value of x is viewed as the population mean, which we're often denoting with the Greek letter mu. Described in previous chapters, we can always compute the expected values of functions of x. Oh, no, not always. Why did I say always? Like at the very <laughs> end of this section, I'm going to give you an example of an expected value that can't be computed. But we can also compute, I meant also, also compute the expected value of functions of x, um, functions of x, that is. Um, so that would be the expected value of h of x in a natural way by saying that the expected value of h of x is equal to the sum over x of h of x times the probability mass function at x. And this formula should make some sense to you because you've actually seen it before. Uh, or something very similar to it before. Remember when, we, remember when we were computing the sample mean? The sample mean was 1 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n x i, which is also equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n uh, x i times 1 over n. And the 1 over n, I mean, if you add up 1 over n, n times, what number do you get? You get 1. And also, 1 over n is a number that's uh, greater than 0. So, actually, you could see this as a probably mass function for xi. So, you could imagine that you have your sample of observations, and you're going to pull an observation at random with equal probability from your sample. If it's pulled from, with equal probability, then you're going to pull it with probability 1 over n. So actually, you've seen uh, this expected value formula before. It's just that this formula down here is a more general notion of, of a sample mean, or not really a sample mean, but of mean. Uh, so it allows for more situations. It allows for um, infinite uh, possibilities for x and so on. The expected value is, in some sense, a best prediction for the value of x. And uh, this form, uh, no, did I say sample mean? The I don't think I did. Expected value. Uh, you can see this footnote for what sense in which it's a best prediction. But it's, uh, hence the term expectation. It's like if you had to guess what value this random variable is going to be, uh, you can use the expected value to do that. And it will be uh, correct in some sense. So, example 11, compute the expected value for some of the random variables that we've seen in previous sections. Uh, so, Bernoulli random variables, discrete uniform, this uh, discrete uniform random variable that represents a die roll, and the geometric random variable with parameter p. Okay, so let's get started. 
Um, the first situation for a Bernoulli random variable, the expected value of x is equal to the sum of xp of x and the values of x for which p of x is possibly uh, non-zero will be x equals zero to one. So this will be um, zero times p of zero, which is one minus p. Uh, this corresponds to the probably mass function at zero plus one times p where p is the value of the probably mass function at one. I guess this uh, notation is actually a little unfortunate uh, because I've got a couple different p's. So maybe I should switch out the notation for the probably mass function in this example, just switch it with f. That could uh, probably make things a bit more clear. Uh, so this still, nevertheless, in any situation, is the probably mass function for x. Okay, and well, let's see, that just goes to zero and that's going to equal p, so that means that the expected value of x is equal to p, which is nice and actually rather insightful. It's saying that the expected value of a Bernoulli random variable with parameter p is equal to the probability that that random variable is equal to one. And that's actually a very useful fact. That's rather useful. Uh, it allows us to relate Bernoulli random variables, probabilities for events, and expected values. It gives us a way to, what we could do if we wanted to relate expected values to probability of an event is create a Bernoulli random variable that's equal to one when that event occurs and zero otherwise and then the expected value of that random variable would be the probability of that event occurring. Uh, but I'm just going to leave that issue for now. Uh, let's work with the uh, next example. So the expected value of s is equal to the sum of, let's say, sp of s. Again, we're talking about uh, a probability mass function when we're talking about p uh, down here. Uh, and uh, let's uh, think about what are things that this random variable could take with positive probability. We'll end up summing from s equals 1 to 6. So that's going to be, uh, let's see, p of s is always 1 over 6. So this is equal to 1 over 6 times the sum from s equals 1 to 6 of s. And actually there's a formula for that. Hopefully you remember that from, from your algebra classes. In general, you have the sum of uh, s equals one to n of s. Uh, this is a sum of an arithmetic series. That's going to be um, n times n plus one divided by two. Okay, which means that this sum is going to equal one sixth times six times seven divided by two. Those two sixes cancel out. So this will equal seven over two or 3.5. Okay. Finally, we have the expected value of, what am I calling this geometric random variable? I'm calling it N. The expected value of n, which is going to be the sum of n times p of n, uh, where n ranges from 1 to infinity. All right, this is going to get much more complicated. Uh, so Because this is going to involve an infinite sum. p of n is going to be, we've got n p 1 minus p to the power n minus 1. And we're uh, summing from n equals 1 to infinity. Let's see. Uh, the p here is a constant, so we can bring that out. We are not summing over p. That means that we can say that this is equal to p times the sum from n equals 1 to infinity 
n times one minus p to the power n minus one. You probably did not see a formula for this. So what are we going to do? We're going to get tricky. We're gonna get really tricky. You've taken calculus. Presumably you've taken calculus one, which includes differential calculus. So you have seen this formula before. The derivative with respect to x of x to the power n is equal to n x n minus one with some assumptions on n like for example that it's uh let's say at least one in which case that would hold in this situation if you're looking at one minus p as your thing as a thing you're differentiating hmm those two things look rather similar which means that actually we could be invoking some sort of differential or de uh, derivative in our sum and say instead that this is equal to p times the sum from n equals 1 to infinity the derivative with respect to p 1 minus p to the power n now you would notice that right now if you were to in fact take that derivative you would almost get what I wrote on the left over here that I've underlined in green. You would almost get that, except you'd be off by a sign, as in you'd get negative something because you have to invoke uh, the chain rule. So what are we going to do about that? Well, we're just going to throw a negative out here. And uh, then it's certainly true. Although I'm going to mention that well, okay, it, it's actually true as written down. There's no there's no caveats yet, but there is going to be one in just a second because I'm going to say that this is equal to negative p times the derivative with respect to p, the sum from n equals 1 to infinity, 1 minus p to the power n. Okay. You can't just bring derivatives out of sums like that. Or you can, but there are conditions. Like, you can't just look at any sum in the world and see derivatives inside of the sum and say, okay, I could just slip the, der the derivative out. It's not that simple. There are details. There are conditions under which you can do this. Those conditions are satisfied here. I actually don't remember them off the top of my head. Um, I just know you can. You can go look at some calculus book or some analysis book. It's probably going to be in an analysis book. Uh, or Wikipedia. Wikipedia has pretty good math articles. And it would tell you when you can switch. Because that's what you're doing. You're switching a sum and a derivative. It will tell you when you're allowed to do that. And I'm just completely sweeping that under the rug. And I'm fine with that because I don't care. I got other stuff to do. All right. Um, the thing though is we know how to compute this sum. You know that this sum is going to become, uh, uh, one minus P divided by P. So that means that this will become negative P. Oops. Wrong color. Negative P. And then we've got the derivative with respect to P of um, 1 minus p divided by p. Which we should probably uh, simplify somewhat and say that this is equal to negative p and the derivative with respect to p of, uh, let's see, 1 over p minus 1. Yeah, that's right. And the derivative, so then we take that derivative and say we've got negative p. And on the inside, after we take the derivative, we'll get negative 1 over p squared. Those two negatives turn into positives. We cancel out one of the p's, and this is equal to 1 over p. There we go. 
this actually has a very nice intuitive um, interpretation, which is that let's say that you're flipping a coin until you get heads. How many times do you, uh, what is the expected number of flips? First one's tails, second one's heads. Makes pretty good sense to me. Or let's say that you have a biased coin and you flip this coin until you get heads and the probability that you get heads is uh, 0.1. How many flips do you need? 10 flips. Seems to make it pretty good sense, at least to me. Um, it, it allows, at least in my mind, a way for me to relate probability of an event happening with time. And say that if that if you were to have an, a, a sequence of independent re replications of this event, this is about how long you have to wait until you see that event happen. Which is another way to think of, uh, or another way to reason about how rare that event would be. Like for example, if there's like a 10% chance of an earthquake every year, how many years is it going to take for you to see an earthquake? 10 years on average. Uh, something like that. That's So I really like uh, that formula and interpretations like that. Okay, moving on. Uh, this is the same body of lecture notes that we've seen before. So we have loaded up the discrete RV library in R when you, whenever you see the R sections. And there is, an, there is a discrete RV function called E that is for computing expected values. So X was a random variable that we defined at some point. That corresponds to the Bernoulli random variable that we were talking about. S corresponds to actually the sum of two dice. So in this case, it, we should be doing seven over two or something like that. Um, uh, if we were actually talking about the same S, but this is a different S. Uh, this is a uh, sum of two dice. Two independent dice, by the way. Uh, not just any two dice. Although I don't know how you make two non-independent dice. That would be really hard. N is, though, what we're talking about. And notice that the answer is approximate. Uh, we know that in the, in the, for this N, the P parameter was 2. So the number that results should be 2, but it's not 2. It's 1.999999. So be aware of that. It's giving us an approximate answer because it's only fi summing over a finite number of uh, places. But you get the idea. You can tell that, that, is, that it's essentially doing the right thing. Uh, okay, uh, continuing on. Expectations are linear functions, and being a linear function is an extremely important property. Um, and it's for that reason that we can say expectations are integrals. But that is a 60-40 idea right there. Instead, we're going to talk about how the expected value of AX plus B is equal to A times the expected value of X plus B. This is something that we can show. Uh, watch the expected value of a x plus b uh, is equal to this. This, by the way, is uh, we. This is basically h of x, where h of let's say s is equal to a s plus b. So we can use some of those uh, that uh, expectation formula that we mentioned above uh, towards the beginning of this lecture, and say that this expectation is equal to the sum over x a x plus b times the probability mass function of x which is equal to the sum over x and then we'll factor all that stuff together we've got a x uh, p of x plus b p of x and then we'll break up the sum and say that this is the sum over x, a x p of x, plus uh, the sum over x, uh, scroll down, scroll down, uh, the sum over x, b p of x, factor out the constants to say that this is a times the sum over x, x p of x, plus b times the sum over x p of x and we can recognize what some of those sums are for instance this sum is the expected value of x and this sum is the sum of the probability mass function um, over 
everything where it's positive. So this is going to sum to 1, and hence you get uh, the result. Uh, a times the expected value of x plus b. Hence it's uh, linear. Uh, the variance of a random variable is given by, we'll call it var of x, which is equal to the expected value of x minus mu, where mu is just the expected value of x. We just don't want to write that again in there because it's, it feels confusing. Uh, so we just put a mu in there. But basically, it's the mean squared distance of x from its, uh, from its expected value. So this actually does correspond very closely to the sample variance as well. If you could think of the sample variance as divided by 1 over n instead of 1 over n minus 1, uh, you could say, we could argue as we did for how the sample mean is very similar to the population mean in terms of expected values and say that this is a sample variance too. So uh, yeah, they, so this is uh, uh, something to notice. The Greek letter that's used to represent the sample variance is sigma squared. And like with the sample standard deviation, you can get the population standard deviation by taking the square root of, of the variance. It's just not as common to do so. Um, all right, uh, so uh, there is actually a handy formula for computing the variance that is often easier than computing it directly. Uh, and it, this formula, you may recognize this from when we were working with the, uh, the uh, did I say sample variance a second ago? Uh, I meant the variance or the population variance, but this formula resembles the formula for the sum of squared, uh, sum of squared errors uh, that, we that we saw in chapter one where you have the mean of x squared minus the mean of x squared. Where hopefully you can tell from my inflection what's being squared. Okay, so the variance of x is thought of as the population variance and is denoted by var x, which is sigma squared, and the population standard deviation is sigma, which is the square root of sigma squared. Sometimes I'll write though, the standard deviation of x because it's it's sometimes nice to do. Uh, all right, so our next example: compute the variance and standard deviation of the random variables listed in example eleven. So uh, if that's the case, let's start out with um, x. We already have the expected value of x, which was p. Uh, the expected value of s, which is uh, 7 halves, and the expected value of n, which is equal to 1 over p. So as a reminder of what we have already. So now let's compute the expected value of x squared, which is equal to the sum from little x equals 0 to 1, um, x squared uh, f of x because that's what I'm calling the probably mass function which is equal to 0 squared times 1 minus p uh, plus 1 squared times p which is equal to p again hence you get to say that the variance of x is going to be the expected value of x squared minus the mean of x squared, which is equal to p squared minus p, which we could be done right there, but people often like to factor this into p times 1 minus p. All right, uh, next example uh, in the case of s. So the expected value of s squared is going to be the sum from s equals 1 to 6 of uh, s squared times probably mass function at s, which is 1 over 6 times the sum from s equals 1 to 6 s squared, 
this is something that we have actually all right you might not have seen this uh, a formula for the sum of squares uh, in your previous algebra classes. Maybe you saw that, maybe you didn't. Uh, but there is, in fact, a formula for that, which I'm gonna have to look up. Okay, so you have that the sum, uh, let's use a different color for this. The sum from s equals one to n s squared is equal to n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 divided by 6. Okay, so using that here, we get to say that this is equal to uh, 1 sixth times 6 times 7 times uh, 13 divided by 6. So those cancel, and that's pretty much all we can cancel. So we get to say that this is equal to 91 divided by 6. Therefore, the variance of s is going to be uh, the expected value of s squared minus the mean of s squared. which is equal to 91 over 6 minus 49 over 4. What is that number? Uh, uh, 35 over 12. And you should have that the variance is always a non-negative number. In fact, the only time that the variance is ever equal to zero is if the random variable is degenerate. That is, if it's effectively a constant. Uh, so it's unlikely that your variance is zero. And uh, and uh, in the more general case, it's impossible for your, for your variance to be negative. So if you ever ended up with a negative uh, variance, then you've done something wrong. All right, for the final one, and this one is where things get weird. All right, and I'm, I'm gonna zoom in for this one. Because this one is where things get really tricky because we're now working with the geometric case and we need to compute the expected value of n squared. Okay, and that is equal to uh, the sum from n equals one to infinity n squared times the probability mass function at n, which is equal to uh, the sum from n equals 1 to infinity. I'm going to go ahead and already do some simplification. We get p uh, n squared 1 minus p to the power n minus 1. Now, how on earth are we going to compute that? Well, we're going to get we're gonna get really tricky is what we're going to do. So we're going to say that, uh, let's, let's zoom in even more. We're gonna say, and you're not, all right, this, this is just so weird what's about to happen. Um, according to my notes, it's actually advantageous to keep the P inside. Uh, so let's, Let's uh, put the p back inside of uh, this sum rather than factor it out. Uh, so we got a sum from n equals 1 to infinity, n squared p. All right. What's going to end up happening is we're going to end up um, adding 1. No, hold on. Uh, subtracting 1 and then adding 1 again inside of that square and leave everything else the same and we're gonna go do some calculations and at the very end of them the expected value oh, go away 
the expected value of n squared is going to appear on both the left hand and the right hand side, uh, left hand and right hand side of an equal sign. So after that happens, the thing is though, on the right hand side of that equal sign, it's not going to be just the expected value of n squared. It's going to be the expected value of n squared plus something times something. And when you have a situation like that, you're going to be able to solve for the expected value of n squared because you just have an algebraic relationship. And you're just going to have to see it and, and, and watch it happen in order to kind of understand. It's just at the very end, all of a sudden, what you're going to need pops out. This is one of those situations where it's a trick and you're going to see the trick and you might not understand the motivation for the trick, but someone did that trick once and it seems to work. All right. So uh, here we go. This part right here is a perfect is a is a square. A perfect square so uh, we can we can now write that part uh, I, I'm not gonna write n equals 1 to infinity all the time that's gonna get annoying so I'm just gonna write a sum up over n down here and say we've got n plus 1 no 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 no, no not n plus 1 n minus 1 we've got n minus 1 squared plus 2 times n minus 1 plus 1. And then we've got p, 1 minus p, to the power n minus 1. Yeah. Okay, and then this is equal to, this is equal to uh, breaking up this part and breaking up the resulting sum. We get the sum over n uh, and we have n minus 1 squared uh, p 1 minus p power n minus 1 plus 2 uh, plus uh, 2 times the sum over n uh, n minus 1 p 1 minus p power n minus 1 plus the sum over n of p 1 minus p to the power n minus 1. Okay, now we can start uh, recognizing some stuff. Uh, the term on the very left-hand side, no, not left-hand, right-hand side, this term, this is equal to 1 because this is just the sum of the probability mass function. This term is the expected value of n minus 1. Okay, and then we get to say that so far, collecting our stuff, um, recognizing those substitutions is the sum over n, uh, n minus one squared p one minus p to the power n minus one plus two times the expected value of, I'm gonna write this as the expected value of n minus one because we have that linearity property that I proved um, a, few mo a few minutes ago. And then we have plus one, all right? And uh, doing some even further simplification, we're able to recognize that the expected value of n is equal to one over p. So that means that this term uh, that we're adding is gonna be uh, one over p minus one. So we got uh, plus two over p minus two plus one. So this will be, uh, so that means that this is going to simplify into plus 2 over p minus 1. And then we're going to take this n minus 1 and say, oh, well, that's a perfect square too. So this will be n squared minus 2n plus 1. All right. So we then get, um, oh, wait, actually, we don't want to do that. No, we don't want to do that. We do not want to do that. Uh, we don't want to do that. We want to do something even trickier. What we're going to do instead. All right, let's write in again what I have what what I have been omitting this whole time. That this is a sum from n equals one to infinity. But we're going to re-index this. We're going to re-index this and say, well, actually, 
this is the same as saying uh, n minus 1 equals 0 to infinity. All right. And then replace all of those n minus 1s with, let's say, j. And say this is j equals 0 to infinity. So we get j, j squared. And the thing is, though, we're... Uh, uh, the first term in this sum, though, is going to end up being zero because j, because all right, plug in j equals zero. That means the first term is going to be zero because zero squared is zero, zero times whatever is zero. So that means that the first term is actually zero. So we get to um, replace j equals zero with j equals one because. Well, when you start at zero, you just add a zero term. You're just adding zero to the sum. So we get to start at one. And this is now looking almost like, almost like uh, the expected value, except for uh, the power up here is wrong. It should be j minus 1 to have the probability mass function, but we've got j instead. Okay, so we'll replace that with j minus 1 plus 1. Okay, and to account for the plus 1, that means that what we need to do is factor out a 1 minus p. So, all told, we will have uh, 1 minus p times the sum from j equals 1 to infinity, j squared p, 1 minus p to the power j minus 1, plus 2 over p minus 1. And that sum is what we started with. This term right here is the expected value of n squared. Oh, look at that. So we get to say that this is going to be uh, 1 minus p times the expected value of n squared plus 2 over p minus one. And as a reminder, at the very beginning of this long statement of equalities is the expected value of n squared. Oh, look at that. We can do some algebra now. For instance, we can subtract over, uh, we can subtract from both sides the expected value of n squared. and say that this is going to suggest that uh, what is uh, 1 minus p minus 1? Uh, that's going to be negative p. So we've got negative p times the expected value of n squared. Uh, we will subtract 2 over p and add 1 to both sides. Minus 2 over p plus 1 to get uh, that this is equal to negative 2 over p plus 1. And then divide both sides by negative p. And now we get to say that this is equal to that uh, the expected value of n squared is equal to 2 over p squared uh, minus 1 over p. And there it is. That, by the way, is the expected value of n squared. I'm just writing it down again because it's not on my screen and because it was put on a separate line. That's what we need to compute. So, it then follows that the variance of n is equal to 2 over p squared minus 1 over p minus 1 over p squared, which is equal to um, 1 over p squared minus 1 over p, which is equal to p minus 1 over p squared. 
Wait a minute. That's hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. That's. Oh no, not p minus one. Uh, one minus p. Okay. Otherwise, that would have been bad because I would have I would have just computed a negative variance. So one minus p over p squared. Uh, did I ask to? Uh, did I did I did I say that we should compute the standard deviation to? It does, it's not it's not super hard to do. You just take the square root. But yeah, I did ask for standard deviations. So okay, computing the standard deviations to. Like that's super easy. You just take the square root of the variance. So the standard deviation of x is equal to the square root of p times one minus p. Uh, the expected uh, the standard deviation of s is equal to uh, the square. Uh, let's see, uh, one half times the square root of uh, thirty five over three. And for n, uh, let's see, the variance, uh, no, the standard deviation of n is going to be the square root of 1 minus p divided by p. Oh, that's an ugly looking p. All right, there we go. And in fact, there are functions for in this uh, discrete RV library for computing variance and standard deviation, they're going to be V, oops, V and SD respectively. And you can see this function computing the variance and standard deviation. Remember that this is not the same as we were talking about before. So uh, we get to compute those things and uh, we get pretty much what we had. So, all right, uh, proposition 10. The variance of ax plus b is equal to a squared times the variance of x. And the standard deviation of ax plus b is a times the standard deviation of x, or the absolute value of a times the standard deviation of x. Uh, actually, this would probably be better to write in terms of that sd notation to say that sd of ax plus b is equal to the absolute value of a times the standard deviation of x. So uh, let's go at let's see this uh, let's let's go ahead and prove this. So the variance of a x plus b. So the variance of a x plus b is the expected value of a x plus b minus we should have the expected value of a x plus b here. Here's the thing though. Uh, the B's are going to cancel because expectations are linear. And the A's, can that A can be factored out in front of that expectation. So that means that A is going to be a common factor and therefore the A can be factored out completely if we just square it. So we get to say that this is the expected value of A squared and then we have on the inside X minus the expected value of X which is equal to a squared expected value of x minus mu squared. Just remember that mu is the expected value of x and that's the variance. So this is equal to a squared times the variance of x. All right, what do we then say for the standard deviation? We say that the standard deviation of ax plus b is the square root, uh, is equal to the square root of the variance of ax plus b, uh, which is equal to, after you do that uh, algebra, the absolute value of a times the standard deviation of x, because you're just going to take the square root of what I've highlighted in blue. Just take the square root of that, and you're good. All right, so there's that formula. Uh, one final note. There is nothing that says that expectations need to be finite or even exist. There are random variables out there that do not have finite uh, uh, standard uh, uh, finite expectations, and they may not even have like like an, an infinite e expectation. They might not have an expectation at all. Like there's just no way to define it. Like I guess technically an infinite expectation is considered undefined. 
but it's like you can't but there's a sense in which it is defined like infinite just means arbitrarily large but even then even then you might not be able to say that it's even infinite it's just it could be anything there are random variables out there that don't have expectations so uh let's actually see an example of this this one's a fun one uh this is what's known as the saint petersburg game consider a game where a fair coin is flipped until it lands heads up a player would earn a dollar if the game ends with one flip, two dollars if it ends with two flips, four dollars if it ends with three flips, eight dollars if it ends with four flips, and so on. So basically your winnings are doubling every time uh, this game goes on. The fair price of a game corresponds with the game's expected payout. What then is the fair price to play this game? And before I continue on, I would like for you to think about how much you think this game is worth and how much you would be willing to pay for it. How much would you be willing to play at pay to play this gambling game? What do you think is the fair price? You might be surprised. Um, so let's calculate it. Uh, we're going to say uh, that um, n is following a geometric distribution with parameter one half because that's how you should. We're flipping a coin until we get heads. And this geometric random variable, it's a fair coin, is what will model such an experiment. So then, what would be our winnings? It would be 2 to the power um, n minus 1. Because if you get one flip, that would be, you should get $1. So n minus 1, so that'll be 1 minus 1, so 2 to the power 0, which is 1. Uh, if we get, If it took two flips, that's... 2 minus 1 in the power, so there'll be 2 minus 1. Uh, so the power will be 1, so we get 2 to the 1, which is equal to 2. And if we have 3 flips, that's going to be 2 squared, so we'll get 4. So this is, in fact, corresponding to what we think it should. All right, then, what we are computing is the expected value of 2 to the power n minus 1. Which we can make our lives a little bit easier by saying that this is 1 half times the expected value of 2 to the power n. And we know how to compute the expected value of 2 to the power n. So we'll say this is 1 half, and we have the sum from n equals 1 to infinity, 2 to the power n, and then we write down the probability mass function for the geometric random variable, which is 2 to the power negative n. Or which is the same as, that's the same thing as 1 half to the power n. So n minus n that's going to be one. So this is one half times the sum from n equals one to infinity, one, which is equal to infinity. This game has infinite value. You should pay a dollar to play this game. You should pay $10 to play this game. You should pay $100 to play this game. You should go to the bank and take out a loan for a billion dollars and play this game. Because this game has infinite expected value, any finite price is a bargain. And yet, no one in their right mind would ever do that. No one thinks that this game is really worth anything. People think this is a terrible game. And why that is, is somewhat remarkable. It gets to the point that once you've earned a million dollars, another million dollars doesn't seem that great. I mean, it's pretty good. To go from $1 million to $2 million. That's nice. Th same thing with $1 trillion and $2 trillion. Like, you're gaining a trillion dollars when you go from $1 trillion to $2 trillion, but it doesn't really feel like it. Like, you already got everything you want at $1 trillion. The other trillion dollars is just gravy. So basically, the point is, with this game, the way to rationalize the paradox of this game the fact that its expected value is infinite but no one wants to pay that is that people are not actually thinking about the winnings in terms of literal money they're thinking about it in terms of the utility they get from that money and people know that the net the next trillion dollars is not as good as the first trillion dollars so in that case this game actually doesn't look very good
when once you actually account for decreasing utility from your winnings. That's how you resolve the paradox. You resolve it with economics. That's it for this video. Uh, we have been talking about general ideas and random variable theory. Let's call it random variable theory. That seems like a good word. Uh, probability mass functions, uh, cumulative distribution functions, all that stuff. These are general things that all discrete random variables have and expectations, uh, excluding the cases where they don't exist. They they are they're generally around two. So now we're going to start looking at specific examples of common families of random variables that probabilists care about. The first one being the binomial probability distribution. Um, a lot of the ideas also that we talked about here actually transfer over to the continuous case. When we're talking about continuous random variables, uh, they have analogs that are pretty similar. What you do is you replace probably mass functions with probably density functions, and you replace sums with integrals. So that's, what, that's how you go from the discrete to the continuous case. And, but everything else applies. Everything else is the same. Variances, ex expectations, uh, CDFs, probably mass functions become probably density functions, which are pretty similar. So these are all basic ideas that you're going to see over and over again when talking about probability. And from this point on, we're going to, for the remainder of this chapter, we're going to be looking at specific examples. Uh, uh, because the advantage of talking about a family of distributions is once you have a family of distributions, you get to talk about you get to talk about it once and then you get to generalize to lots of different cases. And it's like the expected value. If you're able to recognize a random variable as being a particular case of a binomial, then there's an expected value formula available to you and you don't need to compute it by hand. You shouldn't compute it by hand because it's going to be a pain. You could just use that formula and it's really easy. Same thing with a lot of these other uh, random variables, hypergeometric ne negative binomial, there, they would be a pain for you to do over and over again, but because we've identified a family of random variables with common characteristics, someone computed a formula, and now you get to use that formula. And that's really nice. That's really nice. Okay, so uh, I'll just uh, leave it at that. Uh, we will end this uh, the study of this section, and I will see you later. I will see you when we start talking about binomial random variables.